Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, the topic of my talk is uh, about infant piezoelectric market systems and how these systems, uh, we, I expect them to enable more uh, smart systems in the future. Uh, a little bit about myself and my group. Uh, 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 my group here at the UCF is called Dynamic Market Systems Lab. Uh, I received my PhD at Georgia Tech in 2008, and I'm an associate professor in the uh, Department of Electric Computing Engineering since 2014. Um, I have worked in the area of microelectromechanical system for the past 15 years, and I'm inventor, co-inventor of uh, 12 issued and two pending uh, US patents, and the great majority of these patents have been actually uh, licensed by companies. In my group, uh, we have labs both in HEC and Research One. I've graduated six uh, gra uh, masters and six PhD students so far, and currently I'm advising uh, seven PhD students and one master's students. Uh, we, our operation is heavily dependent on microfabrication cleaning facilities, and you may imagine how fast we're moving right now. <laughs> we're pretty much to a standstill at the moment. And uh, my research in the past and currently has been supported by uh, uh, a balance of federal and industry uh, funding and pretty much like half and half uh, at each, each point of time. In terms of teaching, uh, I intentionally teach a variety of courses, uh, more than eight different course titles in microelectronics, starting from early undergrad courses like uh, Circuit One, all the way to graduate courses on microfabrication and uh, sensors and microelectromechanical systems, and this is just uh, me trying to keep myself on on the on the uh, edge and uh, trying to push myself to keep learning. And I, I really enjoy uh, teaching, and I uh, encourage students to to focus on the process of learning as opposed to the material that is being uh, presented to them. Uh, so uh, to focus on the topic, I start by uh, thinking about how we envision smart system. Usually uh, when we think of a smart system, uh, the first thing that comes into to mind is a powerful processing unit. And it's not as obvious that a powerful processing unit on its own, and uh, that's not necessarily a smart system. And uh, unless that processing unit can actually interact with the surrounding uh, environment, uh, you can't really know about much about that powerful processing unit. So there has to be ways for the processing unit to receive information from the sur surrounding and be able to change uh, the surrounding by implementing uh, the outcome of a processing or a decision made. And in that sense, uh, most of the smart systems today have one uh, more than many, actually several sensors and actuators integrated to them. And these uh, sensors, they all have to be miniaturized. And uh, in the process, they should be designed in a, in a way that they don't lose performance while they're being, uh, being uh, scaled down. And they have to be really power efficient because we know most of these smart systems rely on battery and uh, sometimes even uh, remotes. Uh, uh, basically uh, scavenging of power from environment. So low power becomes really important. And when you think of the size, uh, there are other advantages in terms of what you can do when the size of a system reduces. A good example would be uh, something that everyone kind of familiar with today, like Alexa um, or any similar system like that. They have an array of uh, microphones, as you can see in this here. And you may imagine why would you need in several microphones. It's not that it's, uh, it's just because they're small and you put them there, actually having more than one sensor uh, has a lot of advantages and add uh, not only redundancy, but also capabilities that otherwise wouldn't been, be able to achieve. Uh, specifically in this case, when you think of uh, several microphones, you can actually detect which way the voice that is uh, calling Alexa is coming from, and then start uh, basically focusing the reception of the information on that end, so that if there is interference, that get that doesn't clog the, the uh, information. And uh, in these days, there are actually uh, soon there are going to be micro speakers, and there are a lot that you can 
do with those as well. Now, in terms of uh, uh, energy transduction mechanism, there are two uh, important or major way of doing uh, uh, the uh, transduction. It's either capacitive or uh, piezoelectric. In a capacitive, as you can see here, uh, you're depending on basically two uh, electrodes that are uh, conducted, but, uh, conductors that are actually placed close to each other. And once one of these uh, plates start moving against the other one, you get a signal if the, if the two conductors are biased properly. And this scheme is really simple to implement. As you can imagine, you, all you need is two uh, conductors that are brought close to each other and reducing the distance between two conductors at micro scale using microfabrication techniques is not that complicated. And this is why most of the transducers today still are uh, capacitive in nature. Uh, on the other hand, piezoelectric transducers, they depend on piezoelectric property in uh, certain crystallines. And uh, basically what that is, is that uh, the crystal it becomes uh, sensitive to a strain. And once there's a strain developed in the crystal and you're gonna get an internal dipole and that generates a current or voltage that could be externally picked up by the metallic or conductive uh, patterns on, on the crystal. Now, uh, because this is only gonna happen in certain crystals, uh, piezoelectric transduction, even though at the macro scale has been in use for the longest time, at micro scale, it hasn't been competitive compared to uh, capacitive, even though piezoelectric transduction is actually a lot more efficient than capacitive. And the reason is that these crystallines, they usually are considered ex exotic material and um, you can't easily integrate them with microelectronics until recently. So what changed that picture was that uh, starting at late last century and uh, early this century, uh, there were uh, a lot of work on sputtering piezoelectric material. And specifically, there's this uh, uh, aluminum nitride films that, is, uh, that uh, were studied heavily at that time. The reason aluminum nitride was picked was that it's uh, made of, it's a compound that is made of aluminum and nitrogen. And uh, nitrogen gas, obviously, it's actually, it's a benign gas. And aluminum is a metal that is already used in uh, uh, microelectronics. So adding that to any foundry wouldn't change much in terms of uh, uh, processing compatibility. And once that happened, uh, early this century, there were uh, a breakthrough and a company called Avago at the time it was Agilent, Agilent started uh, shipping out aluminum nitride based filters, acoustic filters. And from that point on, aluminum nitride has been actually uh, used in a lot of other transducers at micro scale. And the prediction is that at some point, uh, piezo MEMS actually is going to surpass other transducers in the future based on the properties that it can offer. Uh, and uh, this, this is what I believe going to happen as, as well. Now, uh, in my research to uh, show a little bit of our, my contribution to in this field, uh, my PhD was in uh, this is specific technology that I coined as tinfoil piezoelectric and substrate resonators. So the device is composed of a tin film of uh, silicon uh, that uh, an overlay of uh, two metal lines with an aluminum nitride or any other sputter tin film is deposited on top and uh, the aluminum nitride or piezoelectric layer uh, plays the uh, role of a transducer and once you apply a voltage to that you can actually excite uh, a, a vibration mode or sense a vibration mode and therefore you can make resonators this is uh, what you see down here is actually a um, basically a remote shape of a lateral extension of block resonator that would be excited in a resonator is schematically shown here. These are some of the examples of uh, the innovative designs that we have made in the past. We are considered a leader in this uh, field of technology. And uh, for example, in this picture, what you see is that we have uh, fabricated two exactly same designs. In one, we actually put a 
uh, reflector around the device, a frame basically around the device. And by doing so, we have increased the quality factor of the resonator by uh, three times. Uh, and, uh, for those of you who are familiar with quality factor, it's basically is a measure of uh, efficiency, energy efficiency in the system. Uh, moving on, uh, the, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the uh, uh, current projects in my group. So uh, about a year or two ago, uh, we started experimenting with idea of uh, passing current through the silicon layer while the acoustic wave is, is uh, basically excited in the, in, in the TPOS structure, for example, in the of the crown silicon structure with the uh, in, in intention of actually uh, taking advantage of um, the phonon and electron interaction in the film. And this is called acoustic electric uh, property. And so under a certain uh, criteria, if the uh, drift velocity of electron is actually more than the acoustic velocity of phonon in the system, you can uh, amplify the wave that is propagating in your uh, system. And we have been able to actually now experimentally show that for the first time. This is a fabricated device. This project was funded by NSF and the extension of the work has been now uh, proposed to DARPA to create adaptive uh, filtering and delay lines. Uh, this system is actually non-receptacle in nature. So you're gonna get, uh, get gain in one direction and while in the opposite direction, you will get uh, a loss because of the, this criteria that we just talked about. Um, now, the, in the near future, the direction that I'm hoping to focus more on is to use these resonators in sensing systems. Uh, uh, so in the near future, I would like to actually develop systems that prototype systems that you can actually use these resonators to sense different properties. Now you, you can see two examples of this in this slide. On the left, this is a resonant accelerometer. You've already shown uh, really data uh, from these devices. The application for such a device would be to wirelessly measure uh, acceleration or vibration of a system. Uh, the reason that you can do this wirelessly is that the piezoelectric property is a self-generating uh, property, so you don't have to necessarily have a power. You can actually shoot a, an electromagnetic wave uh, and through an antenna excite the device and you get the response that is reflected back from it. And uh, my hope, uh, this actually, this, this project uh, is already funded by a company and is turning into a, a phase two. Um, and the patent that was based on this technology is licensed by the company, but I'm also hoping to find collaborators that can use these for other applications such as uh, medical. And I'm already starting to work with some of my colleagues here at UCF uh, to do so. Dr. Uh, Mansi in uh, MAE is one of the uh, collaborators that I'm trying to work with. In terms of uh, other applications, this work is a collaboration between my group and uh, Dr. Roger Rahman uh, in MSC, uh, we are trying to use these devices to uh, detect cells, single cells, and by uh, creating a fluidic, part fluidic channel on the backside of the resonator. And again, for this, I'm hoping to turn these into uh, resonant mass microbalances and use them for biosensing in the future. All right, thank and, you. And so I'd like to thank my group, uh, and uh, I'm done.